I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. You usually don't see directors or documentary makers making a movie about somebody so personally close to them. Every family has its tragedy, but not everybody then um, dives into that tragedy in depth decades later mm -hmm. to re-explore it. Was it painful for you to kind of go through every piece of tragedy in your life? Yeah, it was. I think she's very um, obtuse about why she let me make the documentary. So I can only sort of guess what the reasons are. We grew up together. So I think that that was that backstory that we shared. I think she's thought on an instinctual level, if I was going to have this happen, this is the right guy to do it. So, uh, Griffin Dunn, I almost don't know how to introduce you. You've been in a billion movies and shows and everything. But ostensibly you're here because it's a combination of two things. One is um, you made your first documentary and it's um, uh, about your aunt, Joan Didion. Um, and, you know, I always forget titles. So the Center Will Hold will its Own. Hold, yeah. yeah, or we'll say it again. The Center Will Not Hold. The Center Will Not Hold. But I always think, I just think that's the Joan Didion documentary on Netflix. So I, when I, I search I for Netflix, I search Didion. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, A, Joan Didion has been uh, one of my all-time favorite writers for decades. Like, she basically, I mean, it's amazing. She She basically created the entire genre of, let's call it creative nonfiction. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so many writers then have, you know, ran, run with it. You know, uh, you can even say anybody from like Tom Wolfe to Hunter S. Thompson to essentially every nonfiction writer yes. now who's right. who's decent. Because um, I, think, I think she basically added storytelling to nonfiction. She was a real writer who wrote about true things. And usually they would be separate. Mm -hmm. like a like an astronaut would write this is what it's like to be in space but he's not a writer he's an astronaut mm -hmm. and a writer with the talent of your, of Joan Didion would write fiction and, and not describe write the feeling of being in space and the right. wonderment of what what an astronaut is going through you know but, i always wish they'd send poets to the into outer space just to see what they'd say i bet you that will happen pretty soon <laughs> but uh you know there's there's so many fascinating things to break down, which is, you know, A, Joan Didion, B, the process of you doing this documentary, C, your career, uh, D, your whole family is like mega, you know, family. Uh, so, so I want to get to the Didion documentary, but I think that it's worth kind of explaining your roots, like where you came from. Mm -hmm. So, cause she was your aunt. Dominic Dunn's your father. He's famous in a lot of ways. I'll let you describe. Uh, John Gregory Dunn's your uncle. 
Um, all sorts of things, ups and downs happen to you. You know, let's let's start at the beginning. Okay, well, you're, you're in California. But you're, my, my 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 father was a television producer from. He started in live television, and um, his boss um, had him move to Los Angeles, and he started a, a company called Four Star, with David Niven and Robert Coote and Charles Boyer, being three of the four stars. And um, so he he moved us to California first in the in the uh, early '60s. And his brother, John Gregory Dunn, married Joan, my aunt, and they moved to California. And uh, my father was very, very social and gave a lot of parties and brought John and Joan into their sort of social Hollywood world. What was, was Joan doesn't strike me as the type to be, uh, is it okay if I call her Joan? Should yes, I say please. Joan, did he? Yeah, sure. That's uh, Joan doesn't seem to be the type to be like the life of the party. She seems like more... Like she'd be the on the outskirts looking in, but but definitely going to parties. I mean, she, she she's, wants to she's, observe. She, she she's totally, um, you know, some of her great greatest stories about or essays about Hollywood are the things that she's observed. You know, and and uh, and and chronicling the way people talk about movie making and deal making, and uh, you know, she just loves that's like poetry to her. That mm. people talking about their deals and who's in and out at studios. So. You know, she's very much of a, a player, but a quiet one. Um, you know, and they are, you know, growing up, John and Joan for us was one word, you know, and they were inseparable. Can I ask you about that? Because you were bringing this up in the documentary, and she she sort of suggests in the documentary that, um, and you'll, know, you'll remember the exact phrasing, but she sort of suggests she doesn't really know what real love is, like that kind of romantic love. But it seems like they were very much in yeah. love, and they were inseparable, like, forever. But they were also kind of not at points. Well, that's you know her perfect dichotomy between you know matters of the heart and then matters of of work. And I think she saw what she meant was, you know, she didn't like fall in love in a sort of typical fashion the way most people think of it. She looked at a man who she saw immediately was a a partner and a writer who would understand the. The importance of of putting your work first when you when you needed to, you know, find using the material that you have, and that's how both of them worked, and and so it was a work, but it was also they were like penguins, you know, um, they were lifelong partners who were very much in love, but um, you know, it's sort of like there's another moment in the movie. Where you know Joan is talking about you know being a mother and and missing her child who was two and a half years old, while she is, you know, in San Francisco, um, writing slouching towards Bethlehem, and she sees a child who's on acid, who's not much who's older five than years her daughter, old. who's five years old, wearing white lipstick, on wearing the floor. white lipstick, and here she's a mother who, on one hand, misses her daughter very much, but she's also a writer who looks at that moment and goes. This is gold. And I was wondering about that when I watched it. I mean, you I think you asked her what's your what was your reaction? And she has this very expressive way of talking yeah. to you where she's like she's like talking with her hands first. The the words coming out with her hands first. And she's like, This is gold. Mm -hmm. And uh and I actually thought that was a very maybe that's the dichotomy you speak of. I thought that was given someone who is the mother of a two year old at that point, and that she was missing the two year old, which I liked how you balanced it off. It was a very, uh, I mean, my first instinct, even as a curious person, my first instinct would probably be more compassionate, which is like, where is that girl's mother? What's going to happen to this girl? And that's what you think she's going to say in that long pause before she yeah. says. You know, spoiler alert. But um, yeah, it's a reveal. Yeah, in but the it's, it's a total reveal. But you know, ultimately, she's a writer and a journalist, and she's her thesis that was contrary to what everybody else was writing about the hippie movement and the summer of love and hate Ashbury. Um, she didn't find it groovy, and uh, she was looking at the children and the families that were falling apart. That's sort of where the title comes from. The center will not hold. It was like the end of the Eisenhower years, and we're going into a, you know a period where the the nuclear family is 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 falling apart, and children are running away, and drug abuse is rampant, 
and it, it was a darkness uh, in American culture that people at that time weren't attuned to. But that was what she was seeing. And I guess, given her observational tendency, it's not like she ever. Uh, it doesn't seem like she indulged in full. She would never indulge fully in the scene that she was exploring. She would be more observational. Yeah. So, so she's able to say, you know, this is gold while thinking of the bigger picture of what she's writing. But do you feel perhaps a more compassionate response was warranted? I don't know that it was warranted because I, I, I couldn't. I wasn't surprised at all by her. Uh, and as a documentarian on this movie, that was gold I said for saying that, that was gold. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, for me. But you know, I often get asked, "What did you learn about Joan that you didn't know before?" And and that kind of, uh, you know, now that John is 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 not in our lives, that sort of dichotomy of a work ethic and a family love. I mean, she's a serious family person. That's just not just with her own Didion family, but with. All the Duns, you know, that was like she just fell in love with our family, and and they became a priority in her life. Um, well, she even says in the documentary, she said, uh, she said um, she visit with with John. She visited his family in Connecticut, fell in love with the family. So then she fell in love with him. Absolutely right. That's exactly right. And 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 so I, you know, that, those dichotomies and and her just her approach to work and her commitment to finding out what she's thinking and 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 she'll be just as brutal on whatever political figure she's dissecting and disseminating and you know showing what message he's he's trying not to say um as she's breaking that down she'll be just as ruthless on herself to find out what she's thinking um, yeah, I think she and says, what she's feeling. I think she says she basically uh, writes in order to discover what she's feeling. So, like the, and I think that comes out really full. Uh, it comes out comes out from the beginning, but you really, really viscerally feel it when the stories are so personal, like in the Year of Magical Thinking exactly. or Blue Nights, or uh, uh, where it's th these tragedies are happening directly to her as opposed to her observing a tragedy. Yeah. Um, I think in you get the sense that she's discovering herself too while the while the events are unfolding, and she's using writing for that, which is beautiful because I think most writers think, "Oh, I'm going to write about uh, you know World War II," and they have a theory and they write it, and it becomes a book. Whereas she's kind of, I think that's the power of her writing is that she's exploring all these all these things in this beautiful language. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. She 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 writes to know what she thinks, and you know you. You, John told me once when I was a little kid trying to have a writer conversation with Joan, I said, so what are you writing now? And John said, you never ask a writer what they're writing. And that's particularly true with Joan because, you know, she says, well, if I could tell you what I was writing, I wouldn't have to write it. Hmm. You know, she's, she, she digs deep. Um, either, you know, if it's, if it's not herself, it'll be the subject she's writing about or the theme. Uh, you know, that's interesting now that you say that because if I think back on her books, it's not like you can take any one book and say this book is about X and give one sentence. I mean, you can, but you'd probably be wrong a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, even the year of magical thinking, everybody says, oh, it's the year after her husband, John, dies and her, her daughter's in a coma and has all these problems. But it's not really true. It's really what all these different emotions she's dealing with. It's a very com complex book. And the last thing she she expected was that it would become a sort of um, companion to people who had felt loss, to people who, who were grieving. You know, this was a book that, that uh, opened up uh, an entirely new audience. It is, you know, it's it's it turned out to be ironically her biggest bestseller, and also a Pulitzer Prize, right? And or, Pulitzer yeah. and um, or National Book Award, yeah, one of the two. It's funny that and, neither of us it, we knew it, it won a big national award in the U.S. <laughs> and it's her most awarded book. <laughs> yeah, and it, it certainly is. But she wrote it. She didn't expect many people to read it. Her publishers didn't expect it to be. They it's they a sad book. Very 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 sad, and the, and they had a very sort of uh, minimal printing of the book that was out they thought you know this is our favorite writer in our in our publishing house but this is important to her we'll 
we'll do her the favor and print, you know, 30,000 copies or something. And everyone was taken by surprise by the way this book was embraced um, by not just, you know, older people, but an entirely new audience of, of you know, kids, like, would tell me if they found out I was uh, related to Joan, they would say, that's the first book I read when my grandmother died. Yeah. You know, that was, it wasn't intended that that way, she, or she didn't expect it to have that reaction. It's funny, the way you said that, when kids found out you were related to Joan. So this is a stupid question, but if you're walking down the street with Joan, who's more recognized, you or her? Oh, I'm her, her. That's so funny, and you've only been in like 50 movies. Yeah, no, but uh, no, but she's, she's from the moment she appeared in, in, standing in front of that stingray, the Julian Wasser yeah, photo, yeah. that famous photo, uh, she's been a highly recognized figure. And, you know, one of, uh, a, a story I love about my Uncle John is um, when they would be in a restaurant, they, they often ate at a restaurant called Elio's, and people would, at other tables, would crane their necks to look at Joan. And if John saw that, he would move back in his chair so they could get a view of her. Why would he do that? Because he was being helpful. He was letting, you know, I... letting people... See there, the famous Joan Didion, you know. I want to break down her writing a little bit more, and I want to. And you also had a fascinating pr process of bringing this documentary to life. But uh, now I want to reel it back mm -hmm. again. Your beginning, so you're because you, you grew up in Hollywood. All these things are happening all around you. I think you mentioned in the documentary, Harrison Ford was like their carpenter. Mm -hmm. Like it's just you kind of just stumbled upon both madness and greatness in in Hollywood there. Was that, did you, were you aware of what was going on around you? Like how, what a special sort of uh, situation this yeah, was? Yeah, I was. I think because I was, I think because I was so young, I was so impressionable and I had such a vivid memory for, um, for, for moments at, at that time from the late 60s, you know, through the 70s and at the beginning of, uh, you know, this renaissance in the movie business that John and Joan were writing. And for whatever reason, ever since I was like 13, they always included me in their social gatherings. So I would go, you know, as a young teen, I'd be going to their parties and, you know, some of the greatest actors and directors. And they also wrote about crime, so there'd be a homicide detective sitting next to a movie star. And, you know, it was a... Like, who were some of the movie stars? I'm just, I'm being oh, gossipy now. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, well, I mean, Warren Beatty was, who's mentioned in the movie, was was uh, a a a figure, you know, who was, who was at a lot of their parties. And... Uh, um, I'm going to blank on like the, there would be like directors, you know, that, you know, Spielberg would, would be at, 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 when they all had houses near each other at the beach would be over. But also there was a writing community too. There was, you know, as, as limited as it was, there was Christopher Isherwood and Brian Moore. And, um, so it was a real, you know, it was a it was a really interesting time in in Los Angeles history. And, and yeah, I feel like um, I mean, people often talk about let's say the late sixties, early seventies. There was a real like all of these directors who became essentially the best directors in history yeah. kind of got their start at that period. Like like a Scorsese, for instance, or and Marty Spielberg. was uh, Marty was around. I don't think he ever came to the house, but but they would all see each other at the beach. You know. So is this what kind of reeled you into being interested in acting ultimately and, and making that a career? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was, uh, although because, because they were writers and I was an avid reader of Rolling Stone and Hunter Thompson and Tom Wolfe, um, I thought I wouldn't mind being a, I'd, I'd like to be a writer too. Um, but my path sort of took me to New York to study acting, and uh, I didn't finish high school because I got kicked out. So good for you. How did? Why did you get kicked out? I, I got kicked out for smoking pot in the state of Colorado, the first <laughs> place to legalize it. Um, so I went to I went to New York. I didn't figure I'd get into a particularly prestigious college, and uh, you know went to the neighborhood playhouse and was a waiter and a usher at. Radio City Music Hall and had all the obligatory funny little jobs that. But but that's interesting too because you would think that oh you have your father and all his six thousand connections. Uh, did any of that help at all in terms of kickstarting a career? Um, no, it didn't because um, 
as 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 I doesn't was, feel like a meritocracy. Yeah, no. It, it. I mean, believe me, if Dad could have, he would have. But he happened to have been a recovering alcoholic, had burned all his bridges in Hollywood. Was really quite a loathed man. I, I, I wanted to ask you. I heard you mention that in another interview. Why was he loathed? You skipped over. He <laughs> he uh, he had he would drink and have a, a, a pretty loose mouth and would like trash very powerful people. And it would always get back. And then he did the worst crime of all was made an expensive flop movie with Elizabeth Taylor. And uh, and Sue Menger's most powerful agent in Hollywood, her husband wrote the script. Mm. And uh, so, and, and, and dad would make fun of the husband and make fun of Sue while they were all getting drunk in Switzerland making the movie. Um. And uh, he came back, and he was told, unknown certain terms, "You're over. Your your career is done." And uh, indeed, it was. He was totally blackballed. And what so does that? Was, what does that mean? It means no one's returning his calls. No scripts are being read. He's not giving out given opportunities. All of that, and not being invited to any of the big parties that he was. Which is yeah. what you need to sort of, hey, we're going to do this deal, right? And, yeah, he had everything stripped from him, so he. He went to, uh, he got sober. He drove to Oregon um, aimlessly. He had no intention of, he was just driving up the coast. A car broke down in front of like a cabins in, in Oregon. And he lived in a cabin without a phone and just wrote letters and taught himself how to write. Mm. And uh, he got a letter from Truman Capote um, who said, I know, I understand you're, you're there licking your wounds and you're, you're hiding out. And you're ashamed, but Oregon is not where you belong. You you write, you do you do what you have to do up there, but you have to come back. And indeed, he did. He came back to New York and wrote a book, and the book did very well. And he became, you know, Vanity Fair hired him, and you know he he had a a complete phoenix rising. Well, it's interesting that Truman Capote was the. Uh, the person who called him just because for a variety of reasons, but the main re- one, the reason that stands out is, you know, sadly your sister was killed. Mm-hmm. And after that, your father kind of made it his career. It is a totally reinvented career of basically pursuing justice. Absolutely. Like, like going into every high profile murder trial and kind of exploring this intersection between celebrity and violence and murder. Like he, he was front and center at the OJ trial, the Menendez brothers, and he wrote books. Vanity Fair, he was writing for them. He wrote books about all these things. And that became his no, it was career. A ter- it was a bitter, bitter irony that he found his voice as a writer um, when Dominique was murdered. He had, he, he had his calling. Suddenly his, what he was, what he was interested in, what, what stories would drive him, you know, always were about injustice and uh, and about people getting away with a crime. And the man who killed my sister did less than three years. And uh, that drove us all insane. But he he took that rage and, and put it into uh, every piece he wrote since. And and where's that man now? Dad? No, the, um, the man oh, the who killer. killed killer. Uh, the killer is in, um, last I heard he was in Washington state. He's changed his name. I used to went through many years as my dad did as well, you know, becoming tracking him and hiring private detectives to Mm. see what the, you know, you know, at some point you just, you know, I don't know where that piece of shit is. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so he went to Oregon, then moved to New York and then you kind of followed him. Or did your own path to New York? That's right. Uh, yeah, so I, and I, 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 he was on the way down, and I was moving to New York to head up. You know, and uh, so um, why do you think acting could be found in New York instead of L.A.? Oh, uh, I was also, um, I was also pretty snobby about um, about acting. You know, um, you know, having grown up in Hollywood and just being in an environment where really all anybody talks about is movies. Um, I was I was desperate to be in the city. I had a thing about New York from the time I first saw this city at the age of like eight or nine, and I said I'm coming back. And uh, 
I've been a you know an avid lover of New York City you know ever since, and I always knew I was going to end up here. And um, when you moved to New York and you're doing the the, um, the neighborhood playhouse and the, all the different jobs, what so, how did you start learning actually the the skill the craft of acting? And and you know by the way I think people don't realize how hard it is. <laughs> like uh, uh, my this is a side thing. My my daughter's a freshman in college and she was choosing between majors, what to study, neurobiology and acting. And I said, absolutely do not do neurobiology <laughs> because that you could like read a couple of books on and re- mm-hmm. memorize and learn, but acting is like a skill you have to do to, to learn. And there's lots of theories about it and, and it comes from your body and your mind and it's creative. And that's a skill you can use in many avenues of life, which is, I don't know what you're going to do with neurobiology. Well, I mean, that you're, you're very unique as a parent to you know, suggest she go in that direction because uh, especially being an actor, my daughter's an actress as well. And I just thought, oh, it's a world of woe. It's such a heartache, you know. Um, I- I'll support you, but, you know, in, in what you want to do, but it is really, really tough. Um, and I'd be a little discouraged when she was just thinking about it at the beginning. The one who said, told me to just basically shut up and told Hannah, go for it, was uh, my Aunt Joan. Huh. Um, she said that you do what you want to do, do do what you feel and, and you love, you know, and and forget everybody's advice, you know, just follow your gut. So, so that's interesting because that's clearly what she did. Yes, from, from, exactly from day right. one, exactly. And, right. and and it seems like she never doubted her ability to do it. Like she walks right, she wins the contest, goes at Stanford, or goes right into Vogue, or you know mm-hmm. where wherever she was when she won the contest. And then right away they give her this, not right away, but they gave her this great article to write, which becomes this famous article, and then she's off to the races. A- absolutely, absolutely. And, and the thing about that article you're talking about called On Self-Respect, it is you know written under deadline. She had like a night to write it um, um, to because they had the masthead, they had the title on the cover, so she had to write a piece that conformed to that title, On Self-Respect. But what she wrote came from such a deep place. I mean, going back to like her ancestors who were homesteaders and and this Western frontier morality was in this like 21-year-old girl. She came to the city fully formed and and she's exactly the same person now as who wrote that article. But I think that's, that's again, the genesis of this entire genre of uh, narrative nonfiction, which is that, oh, I don't have to research every battle in World War II. Hmm. The research is all inside of inside me. Inside you, yeah. And, and that's how it's going to It's going to, and that's where the, the, the weaving of the words comes out of this, what she pulls out of herself. That's why she's able to do it in a night and still be, it's, it's probably the greatest article ever in Vogue for all we know. I, it's got to be. <laughs> so, uh, so, so you get to New York. Yep. And, you're gonna. What? What do you? How do you study acting? What do you do? So I. So I, I study. I had great teachers. I had a guy named Freddie Caraman at the Neighborhood Playhouse. Sanford Meisner, who started it, um, had um, been diagnosed with Lawrence cancer. Meisner so, method. The Meisner method. Well, how do you uh, describe that? Uh, uh, it's it's um, it's a technique. Um, it's a technique, an exercise called the repetition exercise, where you kind of talk to each other back and forth, repeating the same thing. But what it does is it trains you to listen and to live in the moment and to <clears throat> um, just be incredibly present. And uh, uh, and it involves improvisation, which I, I just love doing. And so it gives you a... Uh, um, the tools for when you get a script, you can um, you can really stay in the moment and 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 have the beats of the scenes unfold naturally. And then later, I studied with uh, Uta Hagen, and it sort of went a step further with that. That it would um, where she was very much on you know past stories, you know the history of your character and. And and a relationship with your objects, you know, with you know the uh, the uh, object of doing, you know, when you're not just standing there talking, but you know, even here I'm sitting, my hands are moving around, and you know, it's all intent and action. What's the difference between that and like? Well, I, I could guess the difference between that and method acting. And in method acting, you're trying to say what about this scene um, 
I can relate to, and then I'm going to act accordingly, how I would act. In the other way, you're basically building the backstory. So I'm thinking of, of after hours in the mm-hmm. beginning, you're, and I'm, this is just reaching back into my memory from seeing the movie, mm-hmm. you know, God knows how many times, 30 years ago, but I have to say first, and maybe everybody, every podcast you've ever been on or every interview you ever had has said this, but after hours, which you were the star of 1985, it's probably, I would say easily in my, it's hard to know what your favorite movie is, but it's definitely like no, in my great. top movies. And at the time that I saw it, it, it definitely was my favorite movie. I was a young person and I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is what it's like to be an adult. The, these experiences are going to happen. And now I'm sitting in front of you. Those experiences were happening to you in the movie that I probably watched 10 times when I was, I don't know, 16 or 17 years old. So it was that was a great movie. No, thank you. And thank you're you. a part producer of that too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Martin Scorsese directed it. Martin, we went to Marty with the script, um, Amy Robinson and I. Um, she found the script. The script, the script was based on like a monologue, right? In some Columbia University class? Yeah, uh, uh, Joe Minion wrote it um, as a uh, for his graduate thesis in film school, never dreaming that Scorsese had ended up making his thesis, you know. Um, How'd you find it? Uh, he was an assistant to a director named Dujan Makaveev, who was a Serbian director. Um, and he was at Sundance, uh, the Sundance Lab, um, one summer, in summer of 84, I guess. And uh, Dujan gave the script to Amy, who was there as an advisor, um, and said, this kid is like kind of incredible. You, you should read this. This is like really special. And she read it and said, that guy is Griffin, and sent it to me, and we sent it to Marty, and off we went. And so Martin Scorsese just like said he, he saw it as well? Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, he saw the, the humor of it. You know, it was... Because Amy certainly knew from being in Mean Streets, she was Teresa in Mean Streets. She knew Marty how funny he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Marty lived uh, like a block away at the time from all our locations. I'm sure that's for all I know. He still lives there. He just seems like a very New York. <laughs> I think he might have gone uptown by now. But so, but uh, uh, and it was like the perfect. We're gonna get into everything else. Sure. It's just it's just you have to understand. For 30 years after hours has been one of my favorite movies. It's the perfect arc of the hero. The whole it's 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 the classic example of you know the arc of the, the the journey of the hero. Like you're kind of in a you know whatever lonely in a slump, whatever you want to call it. You get the call to action somehow in this weird way, <laughs> and then just weirder and weirder things happen along the night while you meet your cohorts along the way, and then finally you're back where you started, but a changed man as a result. Absolutely, but. You're sort of moody and lonely and curious in the beginning. So that could either be coming from you internally, like maybe you were picturing when you first moved to New York and how you were feeling sitting in a lonely mm-hmm. diner, or did you make up the way you were going to act by filling out a backstory of who this character is? He works at some boring job and he wants some excitement in his life and you, you make it up in your head. So which, did it actually help you? Oh, it, it, it helped me enormously. Um, I felt the backstory of the guy I played wasn't that dissimilar than my own personal backstory. But the as far as staying in the moment and not being locked into a way of doing it um, and, and just listening, I, I acted opposite the most lively actors you could imagine. Rosanna Arquette. Rosanna at Arquette. That time was O'Hara. the love of my life. Oh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> because of that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, uh, both when when uh, Marty and Jay Cox were writing um, uh, Last Temptation of Christ, the script, they were in the desert. Uh, I want to say Morocco, but it could have been Palm Springs. But they would sing um, visions of Rosanna and uh, Rosanna in the highest, and they made her this sort of. He, Marty had never even met her, but they the two of them just loved her, so. When we met to talk about casting, the first name out of his mouth was, we got to get Rosanna. Huh. So perfect, too. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so so uh, then you, you do those movies. And 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 it was worth mentioning um, because it's very interesting. That was, American Werewolf wasn't actually your first movie. You you produced your first movie. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's where um, I had a very, very difficult time actually getting a job. I, I, um, I was, I still am, but I was, 
just brutally dyslexic, and I could not read uh, for auditions. I couldn't really read very well off the page. So I would be very, very nervous on top of that, which only made the reading worse. So so I had a hard time getting a job. It, uh, I was, it took about three years or so, or four years, maybe even more. But Amy Robinson, who I mentioned earlier, and a guy named Mark Metcalf, all three of us were out-of-work actors, and we optioned a book by Ann Beattie called Chilly Scenes of Winter. How much, you, uh, how, uh, how, so you reached out to Ann Beattie. Did, how much did you offer her to option It, it was $1,500. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't our money. Mark actually had a was cast as Niedermeyer in um, Animal House, mm. and he used his paycheck to to uh, to get the rights. And we got and and Ann Beattie called up her agent and said, "I'm giving it these kids. They're like something out of my one of my books, and I'm I'm giving them the option for fifteen hundred dollars." And we were in the room, and we could just hear him screaming at her, um, coming right through the phone. But she stuck to her word. She said, uh, the only condition I have is I want to be in the movie as an extra and I want to wear a beehive hairdo. She got her, she got her way. How did you then um, raise the money to, to produce it? We went, we went to, uh, we, uh, we got Joan Micklin Silver involved, who was, who was uh, pretty hot. And we got a deal at, at 20th Century Fox. Then it got moved over to United Artists. And we were making it at the same time as Heaven's Gate was being made. So we were completely ignored. Nobody paid any attention to us. Because they put so much money into that. So much money into that. They were just so stressed out with that going on that we had complete freedom. And I gave myself a small part. I mean, I couldn't have been on on screen more than, uh, you know, a minute and a half. But that scene got the biggest laughs in the movie. And from that little part, I actually started to get work. And... um, What's his name? Uh, Wilford Leach, um, very big director at the time who worked at the public theater, saw me in it and cast me in Wally Shawn's play, Marie and Bruce. And uh, so here I'm working in for Joseph Papp at the public theater, which is one of the dreams that drove me to New York. And uh, and that somehow led to, you know, then I met, um, oh, then I did a play, a Ted Talley play, and then I met John Landis who said, you know, without even reading me, just said, you want to play this guy? Um, and he'd never even seen me work. I still don't understand why he did that. But um, but that's, you know, by by producing a movie, I had to produce a movie to get an acting job. Um, and, that, and that helped for auditions later on. I kind of had the confidence and I chilled out about being dyslexic and, you know, it, you know a career started to build. Do you think it also kind of helped you um, like when you were in an audition later, probably kind of helped you understand all the roles the people in the room watching you were playing and the problems that they needed to solve. In order uh, absolutely to catch right. You. I've had a complete inside track of of the conversation that ha- would happen when I left the room. Mm. Um, and some people might find that daunting, but um, um, but I it, it totally relaxed me. I, I felt um, I knew just what they were going through. I knew. That that people who are auditioning hate to see somebody come in and try too hard. Um, they hate to see somebody look like they need the job, and that's what they're used to seeing. Um, so I put on this. The bigger acting job I did uh, was to pretend I didn't want the job. Mm. Um, How did you do would, that? That was the most challenging. I would just do like I would just sort of slow everything down in my body and just. Kind of give a limp handshake and look like I didn't give a shit. And uh, it, it's funny because I would think a lot of people would say do the opposite in, in the terms of they want to bring a lot of energy into the room. Well, then you you step up your energy for the uh, for um, uh, you know for what you're reading if the mm-hmm. scene requires it. But um, but just sort of the just an attitude that makes that because they're nervous too for you. So putting them at ease gives you, you know, you're already ahead of the game. And so, so uh, then you were in, then you started basically being in a thousand movies. I don't know how many movies you were in. You were in a lot. Yeah, but I was also kind of, you know, uh, it was it was very frustrating to the agents I had at the time that I'd get some acting momentum and then I would stop to produce a movie for Sidney Lumet called Running on Empty. And it was like, what what are you doing? You just... Finished starring in this thing, you're supposed to now go star in another movie. 
so I always had a a conflict, you know, behind the camera, in front of the camera. But but I think it was always gearing me toward uh, eventually being a director. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This documentary about your aunt, about Joan Didion, this is the first documentary you've done. It is. And uh, I feel like we could spend all the time breaking down Joan's writing style and how she does it and what you learn from that. But I, there's so many also interesting things in the documentary uh, I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But the first is how you got it made. Mm -hmm. So you started off on a Kickstarter. Yeah, well, it started even earlier than that. So um, you're, you're Griffin Dunn doing a documentary about Joan Didion. Why, do you, why did you need Kickstarter? Well, because no matter who you are, if you go into a financer and say, I want to do a documentary about a writer, most people's imagination doesn't go beyond the exciting, thrilling scene of a, of a person sitting behind a desk and the camera not moving. They, that's what they kind of just picture. It's a writer. How exciting could this possibly be? And uh, so um, Joan and I had done, she'd asked me to do a, a short film that her publisher wanted um, for, to promote Blue Nights. And I became aware that there was not a documentary about her that had never been made. And so I asked her, <clears throat> and and she was just kind of pure Joan. She went, uh, okay. And from then on, I went, oh my God, what have I done? I've just gotten the go-ahead from this iconic person who is so loved and so personally, people relate to so personally and, it, and has influenced so many people. Everybody has a different interpretation of Joan. And... Uh, and then it was like, where am I going to get the money? Okay, well, let me ask you about that. And I, I hold, hold mm -hmm. the thought. I don't, I'm sorry I interrupted, but, but I just get curious. Like if I'm thinking, where do I go from here? The first thing I'm thinking is, okay, I'm going to interview her for a bunch of days, however long it takes. Uh, and then I'll, I'm going to take archival footage so it's not just staring at a talking head, uh, which, you, which you, you do in the movie. I'll take a lot of archival footage. Uh, and I'll get it as cheap as possible, which is probably ways to do it. And then maybe I'll get other famous celebrities who know her to read sections of her things along with the archival footage interwoven with her interview. Again, what you did, how much could what I just described actually cost? To get that archive, to get the music. Uh, the music. That, I mean, that, and, and, and I, I always knew. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. But there was a, there was a way that the, the terrifying thing for me was the subject was so big that it it needed to be on that scale in telling the story. The mm -hmm. movie couldn't look cheap. It couldn't right. look, you know, I had to get the best cinematographers, you know, and so you have a crew behind that camera is, it's not just like one little sound man. There was like, you know, a, a small, smaller than a feature film, but still a network of people. And so shooting days cost, you know, in the tens of thousands. Um, and I did a lot of interviews and, or I needed to do a lot of interviews. And so I, I, I paid for the first few days out of pocket, uh, few first, not consecutively, but, you know, first few days of shooting. And I thought, oh my God, we're never, I'm never going to make this much money. I'm never going to be able to do it. And my cousin and producer, Annabelle Dunn, um, suggested Kickstarter, and the thing about Kickstarter is, even that we did, we hit our goal that we were asking for, and went doubled it. So your goal was two hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. It kept going. You got four hundred thousand. No, uh, I'm not sure what the final tally was, but still, I don't think it was four hundred. I think it was like two eighty or something like that. But, uh, but still, not enough. Mm -hmm. And, but to get a Kickstarter campaign, you have to make a trailer. And we just made a kick-ass trailer. And that trailer went viral. And mm -hmm. uh, people were so excited about this movie. We were getting press week requests from like all over the world, from Japan, you name it. And they were coming in and there was internet chatter. And- uh, What do you think made the trailer so viral? I think, I think the pictures of Joan and the Stingray and, her, you know, the her biography of just starting out at Vogue and 
uh, and then you know the way New York was in the in the early '60s and late '50s, and and then the California scene, and sorry, and then uh, you know the tragedy that 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 uh, everyone knows about. It was like wow for people. This is I can't wait to see. I've never seen such anticipation for something that we only had a trailer for. And Netflix became aware of that and recognized, um, you know, the scale of, of 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 this subject, you know, and and let me make it right. Well, I think also, like, how many individuals contributed to the Kickstarter campaign? In the thousands and thousands. So, I mean, probably Kickstarter takes a look at that. I mean, sorry, probably Netflix takes a look at that and does a, a calculation. Uh, absolutely right. You know, how many of these people are likely to be Netflix subscribers uh, paying nine ninety nine a month for the next 10 years? And they know then what 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 they could pay you to, to do the movie. Well, well, I think that's, you know, in the, in the crowdsourcing thing, I think that that's more valuable um, than the actual money because um, even if you don't get your money that you need, you you see right in front of you, your audience. You see the anticipation, you know, um, they could see right away, wow, a lot of people want to see this movie. So it was a very easy choice for them. Yeah, I think uh, I think Netflix, it's ingenious, really. They've come up with such great product, but it's it's a very mathematical sort of mm-hmm. calculation, and you help them again. It's you sort of uh, through some backdoor mechanism, understanding what the people on the other side are going to want, and putting it together that way. I yeah. think I think using kind of a sideways or backdoor method often works, and people don't realize that. Yeah, it was, and it worked in a way we we didn't anticipate, you know. Um, um, so once when Netflix came on board, suddenly I've got an editing room and I've got an editing suite and um, researchers and archival archivists and uh, you know a real like network of production, you know, um, helping me. Uh, get this movie going, and I and I got a great editor named Ann Collins. A- the editing is beautiful. I was the just editing say. isn't it stunning? Yeah, it, it's it's. Uh, we had such an incredible time. Um, clearly, that was my most fun on this thing was was to be locked in that windowless room with Ann. We both we 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 both would call each other in the morning and go. I can't wait to get to the office. And it was hard for us to leave, and it was hard for us to let go of the movie too, because it was. Uh, um, we really just. It was like going to see Joan and John and Quintana and my mother and my father and my sister every day. You so know, was, was it? Uh, I mean, was it? Uh, you usually don't see directors or documentary makers making a movie about somebody so personally close to them, and also again. You're exploring a past that's so. I mean, every family has its tragedy, but not everybody then um, dives into that tragedy in depth decades later mm-hmm. to re-explore it. Like, was it painful for you to kind of go through every piece of tragedy in your life? Yeah, it was. Um, um, and I think, in a way, more, in a funny way, more painful for me than than it than it was for her because she she'd already confronted it. In you know, with two books, and knew that my job was to go into these painful areas of of, of both of our lives, and um, but I I think she's very um, obtuse about why she let me make the documentary, so I can only you know I can only sort of guess what what the reasons are, but I, I think I think one of the reasons is not just that we're related and that I'm a filmmaker. I, I think that she knows that I I know the people, I love the people that we lost. And, uh, you know, we share this, we're sort of the last two standing, you know, in the family. And I, I think that she, when she looks at me, uh, she sees someone who, you know, loved her husband and her daughter and I see someone who adored my mother and adored my father, and uh, you know we we grew up together. Um, so I think that there was that that backstory that that we shared. I think is why 
she's th- thought on an, in- an instinctual level, if I was going to have this happen, this is the right guy to do it. Do you think at, at any point you being so close to her prevented you from going into certain parts of tragedy that somebody else might have? Um, yeah, I've often thought, you know, I, um, you know, that the the good news is I got the I'm able to do it because I'm related. But the bad news is I am related, so I don't have the I don't have the the objectivity or the you know the uh, sort of distance that a a, a non related documentarian would to really kind of go in areas that uh, I did, by the way. But 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 it was extremely difficult for me, and I'm sure I pulled out a few times just to spare her, um, to spare her having to do it. You know, I, I you know if 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 people who have a problem with the movie, um, they might say, you know, it's 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 like a love letter, and uh, I'm okay with that. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and we definitely see the full range of her. That's right. So. I mean, I mean, as long as that it honors her work, and it makes the connection between um, how how what she was writing, when she was writing it, and what what's going on in the country. And um, you know, charting her biography with with her work and how her life impacted her work and vice versa, then that was my intention. You know, I think for her, like you say, she's been obtuse about why she let you do it. A, she probably trusted you, but B, we live in a world of Netflix now and YouTube and Trump tweeting, and not everybody's reading slouching towards Bethlehem anymore. No matter how. Uh, historic a book it is, how great it was written, how it created an entire genre. People are reading tweets. Yeah. So to keep a voice, everybody wants their voice to still be relevant. And I think for her, it was a way to still say I'm relevant. I I, I think so too. And I, I think the most um, gratifying um, sort of result of this for me personally has been how people, if they haven't read Joan, they go off and they get her books. And if they have read Joan, they go back to their bookshelf and they reread her. Um, it's 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 really drawn them toward her work. You know, we said to her, their publishing company going, you know, if this turns out, I hope you got enough books in stock, you know, because there's going to be a bump. And and it's uh and people are, are so grateful that there's a profile of a woman who who wrote so thoughtfully. And how rare that is, um, and and could write about the times that we're in, with almost a a, a prophetic things that she was writing at the time really revealed themselves to be the common thought, but at the time they were a little out of out of shape, so um, out of step, and and so you know people read it now and they go, oh my god, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. Well, I think I think I mean. And- you would know a lot better than me, but it, it seems like the language aspect of her writing, which is hard to explain or teach or anything, she just had this like unnatural talent at at writing. And but then it seems like topically, it's she's looking for for chaos and how she could find some some thread in it that makes sense to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and whether it's the topic of her husband's death and and how do you deal with tragedy or the topic of San Francisco and LA and in the 60s. Uh, I mean, how would you explain her her creativity? Well, what's If she were to start thinking about something and, and look at it creatively, what would her mind be like? Well, I, I think she would be drawn to the subject of, 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 of disorder that always sort of what what is... I think she used the phrase in the, in the movie, "the horror of disorder." Yes, and 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 that is what, um, and that horror is what draws her to it, and 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 trying to make sense of it. Um, but it's the process of trying to make sense of it, and realizing that you can't make sense of it. It it's um, there, um, so and 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 that same nonsensical, but effort to make sense of the insensible um you know applied many decades later with um a year of magical thinking i mean you can't make sense of why you sit down at a dinner table and life as you know it 
um, is over. Life changes. Life changes in an instant. She's just trying to understand what what is going on, um, but doesn't doesn't have the answers. And so, so let's just take that. Like she's trying to understand what's going on, but she doesn't use that phrase. Mm-hmm. So, what's the next level of her creativity where she avoids using that phrase but is able to explore well, the topic? Well, it's, it, it's 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 research. Uh, that well, she will look at. Say it's uh, you know in the movie we're talking about the Central Park Five. Um, what she is looking at is she's watching the news. She's watching, you know, Trump get vitriolic about the death penalty, having telling telling the the media that they should be killed before there's even a trial. Um. And then she's reading the New York Times, and then she's reading the New Amsterdam Times, and and then she's saying, "Wait a minute, this is how different is this? Was what was going on in Tammany Hall, and you know, the in in the nineteenth century in New York, and there was graft, and there was, um, you know, people using their own um, personal motives to uh, to get their their own agendas, and she's seeing all of." These things take place. She looks at a um, an accusation of a brutal rape and and a, and a racially charged city, and she's saying there's it, there's more to it than just than just this. This is this narrative goes back. This goes back to the forming of of New York and the the uh, the rules and. Uh, um, that 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 Tammany Hall and uh, you know and elections and 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 the vitriolic um, voices of 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 the daily papers you know and the tabloids and so she's like pulling all of this in and then she borrows down and tries to make sense of it. Yeah, uh, you know, and it's um, it's interesting because while I was watching the documentary. I keep thinking all these things that she was saying about the 60s, whether it was the the kind of cultural uh, events that were happening in in San Francisco or LA or wherever, or or in New York too, which she comments on in in the movie. And also the kind of various uh, viewpoints and writing that come up. It feels like this, you could say the almost the exact same things now. So it seems like the common thread is that history repeats. Yes. But 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 that the the art is sort of kind of finding the unique, you know, maybe the small unique things that are happening in each period and that's what she she was so good at. Like finding the way, like finding the the 5-year-old on acid and yet somehow linking it back to 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 some horror or some disorder that she could write about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. I think um I think that's also why uh you know, people are so um, moved by the picture is that she was writing about that then and now we're in a period where the center is really not holding all over again, where there is, um, there's there's such civil chaos and and the country is just so divided and and we have a leader who, who speaks in tweets and... Uh, and and then there are bloggers who just write the first thing that comes out of their mouth and and you know just lambast and the 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 rage that's going on without the reflection right without the perspective the historical perspective why we're or, like this that or she the wrote about or exactly because a lot of these guys rant on every side without uh Without any perspective, without saying why, where this is coming from inside them, no. I, she never was guilty of that ever with anything no. that she does. It's never. always like something's happening inside of herself that's making her explore these things. Why does she move from New York to L.A. or wherever? You, she says it in the in the movie, like it's something that's happening for her. You know, that mm-hmm. she's experiencing mm-hmm. some horror inside her. <laughs> Did she say to you afterwards? Uh, she liked the. She liked the movie. Yeah, it was. It was more. It was more. Um, 
than just like a conversation. It was. Um, did she want to be in the editing room? Not at all. And nor did she. Uh, you know, it took six years. I mean, an entire year would go by, and she wouldn't even mention like, "How's the movie?" Um, you know, she kept her distance. Um, and so when I had something, which was a three-hour cut, a cut I would never show to a studio or financier, and particularly um, most documentarians would not show their subject, something this raw and this long. But I wanted her to see um, to see where it's at and to sort of like give me um, either the support or the or see the horrified look of disappointment and just go through my worst scenario. And um, so I went to her apartment and um, had these little speakers on the connected to the laptop and uh, I had a iPhone that would record her if she wanted to say something, I'd talk about something but not interrupt the movie. She just would say, just mention something and I'll see it in the time code and we'll go back and go over it. And I said, it's, uh, we'll take a break, a bathroom break at an hour and a half. And, uh, and the movie starts and, and she's looking at herself and footage she's never seen of her giving interviews as a young writer and then seeing her closest friends talking about her and strangers dissecting her work and this archival footage, waves and waves of archival footage to, put to her prose. And I think she was, uh, I think she was overwhelmed by it. Like, mm. like, I mean, imagine seeing your life up there. And, and I think she could, I think the affection that I had for her was palatable and that she was witnessing that and 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 not just me but all the people that worked on it you know you just there was a lot of love in this three and a half hour cut um and so when we got to uh the the, the hour and a half mark i i hit the bar on the laptop so, so we can take a break now she goes what are you doing i go well, we can t- i don't want to take a break and she hits the bar and continues watching the rest of the movie uh, it was one of the most um I'd say the most stressful before the screening and the most uh, emotionally emotional experiences I've I've had screening a movie as well. Would you say uh I mean in the in the arc of your career this is a a a high point, a medium point. I've never seen it so high. I mean in terms of a, a making something that you know you work on so for so long that you there's sort of no middle ground. I, I, this is the, the kind of movie you either totally screw up, or, or you make something that people really, really appreciate that satisfies their impressions and conception of of, of who Joan is. And uh, I think it's um, you know from just following. I mean, I I read every review. I've read you know um, these comments. I read total strangers going on about the movie and Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, I, I've never had that experience, um, you know, that that was so in the vast majority of people who feel so grateful that this movie was made. And so you, you mentioned earlier, a lot of people ask you, what did you learn about Joan that you didn't know before? But what what did you learn about yourself that you didn't know before? Because obviously... Not only is this, not only are you doing something completely new for you, you did this documentary, but it's also about someone in your family who you're very close to. Uh, and, you know, you have a whole career where you've done many things. You could, you'll have a, many things in the future. What did you learn about your own self? Well, I, I learned really with this, with this material, it, it, it was so, and the subject rather, it, it would be. It was so easy to fall into the trap of anticipating what others wanted, and what was expected, and and what was owed. And mm. I, I learned to turn that off. And I, I did as Joan does. I, I, I went inside myself, mm. and I, and I, uh, it became very clear to to me in the editing room with Anne what what works and what doesn't. 
I mean, it would be a process, but I really following instinct and and following. I, I just followed my gut all the way through, you know. And everybody talks about it. That's how it's supposed to work, and you know that's what we do. And it's an inspirational theme in a million football movies. And uh, but I never really, really experienced that. Whenever so, I was in doubt, I just would go. I just felt guided. Well, what does that feel like? Well, how how, how did you uh, kind of learn to respect that feeling? Um. I, I just trusted myself. Mm-hmm. I trusted, uh, you know, I I could tell when something didn't work. Um, if somebody, you know, you go through a process where you're showing, um, with every movie, you're showing it at various stages to other people to get opinions. Um, and, you know, that's always a very kind of stressful experience. Um, without, Not in an arrogant way, but I would get a comment and go, they're wrong. Or I go... I get a comment, and I and I was open enough to be to actually listen to um, listen to not only what they're saying but what they're not saying, and uh, you know, I saw, so I found great guidance in in the notes and the process of from other people who were seeing it. Um, you know, it was a it was a and I and I kind of you know without getting too corny about it, um, I thought about John watching the movie. And I thought John would love that moment. Mm. John would love that. Mm. And, uh, you know, his opinion, uh, his opinion I cared about the most. And um, because I'm talking about his wife. And I could always tell what John (laughs) would have liked or not, you know. Well, so... So now, what's what's next for you? Now this movie's come out. Yeah, um, you're getting on all the podcasts. <laughs> I'm doing. Yeah, I'm plugging. I'm I'm going everywhere. Um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, going to go to London and show the movie there. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm I'm you know doing what I was doing while making the movie and before making the movie is is developing projects for me to direct and produce. Um. You know, I haven't set foot in a major movie studio uh, in a long time because I've just been vacillating between Netflix and Amazon. You know, they've uh, been keeping me very busy as an actor. And oh, yeah, you're in uh, you're in the Amazon show. Uh, I, like I love Dick. Dick. So I was a little milder there. <laughs> well, I know it's okay. I I, I I sometimes would call it. I'm terribly fond of Richard. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the Jill Soloway show. So I, I you know, we're waiting. Uh, uh, it looks pretty good for a second season. We're not sure when, you know, we haven't got confirmation, but we're everyone's hopeful. Um, and uh, so I'm, uh, uh, one of the things I'm just starting to develop um, uh, is uh, a series of after hours ah. um, where there'll be a, a different Paul Hackett and the obstacle updated, of course, and the obstacle will be, uh, technology, and you know, w- when you lose your phone, how the hell do you get home? Oh my gosh, this is this is going to be great. <laughs> you have to. Yeah, y- 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 when when are you going to start shooting that? I, well, we're just starting the the, the the writing, and you know, the we're just very very early. Um, that's that's going to be great. And uh, uh, do you have a sense of who you're doing it for? Has somebody already picked it up? We're going well. Warner's who made the movie is is our partner on it, and then we'll go out with Warner's to the. You know, usual suspects in the cable world, um, but but we have a a wonderful writer who's so connected to. He sounds like you talking about the movie. Um, you know, it's it, it meant that much to him, mm-hmm. and he's got this brilliant take on on um, when technology turns on you, um, and then you know it would be like in real time. So ten episodes over one evening. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then if you know it goes for a second or third season, Paul could be a woman, and the city could be Shanghai, or you know, or it could take place in different cities, and you know, whatever the obstacles are, and wherever we shoot it. That that's beautiful. Well, there's so many different things to recommend from this podcast. The first, of course, is the the uh, the documentary on uh, just just came out like October 27th yeah, so, so just a few days ago uh, uh, about 
your aunt, Joan Didion, one of the best writers in history, and uh, The Center Will Not Hold. Did I, did I get the title you right? You got it. And, uh, but also, I'd recommend all her, her books. And, yeah. You know, you could start from the, the end with, with Blue Nights and the Year of Magical Thinking or start at Slouching Towards Bethlehem and Play It As It Lays, which was uh, her second novel, right? Mm -hmm. Run River was her first Correct. novel. Uh, the White Albums, great collection of essays. Uh, so many so many great uh, uh, collections and stories. Then also I have to recommend After Hours, uh, American Werewolf uh, in, in London. And... Your father's, you know, articles and books. Your I for re preparing for this, I read for the first time your father's article about your sister. Mm. It's a very beautiful article, uh, moving and shows his writing prowess as well. Um, so it all it all runs in the family. I would also mention my uncle John was one of the great journalists and very much in the in the what Tom Wolf called uh, to his regret later on new journalism. Uh, he's included in every one of those collections, and um, although I really you know, feel like Joan Didion invented the, that genre. Oh yeah, no, I mean it was all she. She came. I mean, it was such a wholly unique voice for people to be writing from such a personal level that 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 people could relate to, and then and then take that and put it right about American culture with the same style. Yeah, um, I, I think reading her books is a good lesson for. People who want to be good writers, yeah, like it's a good book to read before you sit down and start writing. Before yeah. you do your rant, read like uh, "Slouching Towards Bethlehem" or "Your Mag Magical Thinking" or whatever. I just want to finish my plug for John, though. Um, um, "True Confessions," um, which was made in a movie with De Niro and Robert Duvall, uh, is one of the great books about L.A. crime, uh -huh. uh, about the Black Dahlia murder, and 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 Studio, which was chronicling his. Nervous Breakdown in Vegas um, is one of the funniest books ever written about somebody going nuts uh, you could read in the sleaziest, in Vegas in the 70s, not the Vegas we have now. Um, so these two had completely different voices, completely different points of view. But, you know, as I say in the movie, they were each other's best editors. You know, they, you know, they, their offices were right next to each other. And, you know, at the end of the day, they'd have their drink and the smoke of the thing and they'd trade pages with each other and read what they've been doing that day and um, start all over again. That's great. And I think it requires that kind of discipline over decades to build up such a great work of, uh, you know, oeuvre of, of art. Yeah, so, yeah, it certainly does. Well, thanks, Griffin Dunn, for coming on the great. podcast. And uh, look, I, I think everyone should follow all these recommendations. And I'm, I'm going to read uh, your Uncle John's uh, books. I haven't read those. You love them. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next time on the James Altucher Show. You did win technically the highest achievement on all bicycle racing. You did reach the heights of the profession. Like you were the best in the world. I think of myself as kind of an outsider that I essentially have been in denial. Like, oh, okay, this person did dope and that's why he won, but nobody else dopes. So. Yeah. I mean, it's misleading that they say they're doing all these tests because really they only test a few people so to just say well we're cleaning up cycling because we tested the guys that are winning okay well then the goal would just be to get second i guess when people look at it and they analyze those guys have taken drugs and why would they do that this is supposed to be a healthy thing it's not that at all it's, it's at the highest level it's it's a war it's a war there's risk and your body's sort of a machine and a machine can be manipulated yeah, yeah. manipulated and programmed and heightened but then finally what you did was you took back your own voice. You're technically the whistleblower. So what triggered you to do that? Hey, if you like this episode and want to make sure you never miss one, because I have a lot of great guests coming up, then subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.